So you will be given some uh, clinical scenarios and you will be asked questions on that. And on the day, second day of the exam, you'll have uh, the patients in the clinics where you, you'll have to evaluate and tell your findings and then the management. So I can talk a lot about what is the process behind formulating these questions and how these questions are marked. But I think that will take up a lot of time. So because it's an exam oriented session, I want you to know that the aim of the exam is not to expect a lot of theory from all of you. It is, it's not a specialist examination. And this is given on the website that the level of knowledge tested is same as they, as they expect from a fourth year resident in the UK. So <coughs> the application of all those things you are reading in your preparation rather than the knowledge itself. So in OSCE, what I have, what research that I have done, these are the three topics which have been repeatedly asked in the OSCE and the thyroid being the most common one. The other, they, so what they do is they want to inculcate all those disorders which, which you know, affect the, which have systemic implications. So orbital cellulitis, orbital wall fractures and thyroid, these are probably the three most commonly asked topics from the orbit chapter in the council. As of the structured oral examination, because you'll have a patient, they won't, they won't give you a patient which have, which, which has an active inflammation or who is posted for surgery. So they don't want to, you know, make those patients sit in the clinical for the clinics for the exam. So the most commonly given patients are the patients with a contracted socket or a patient with a customized ocular processes or a patient of a thyroid disease, which is inactive. So I think you should be thorough with your examination in all these aspects. I got a patient with the customized ocular processes in my exam and the whole viva was about pseudoproclosis. So this, so I'll, I'll just give you a hint. So first they'll give you this picture and then you'll have to just describe what is going on and then they'll ask the subsequent questions. You rightly pointed out that this is the proclosi. So what you see here is the diffuse clearance show. What you miss is the scleral show and later interaction in the right eye as well. And I, I think it's a good idea to also comment on the, because you know that this you're keeping thyroid eye disease as a differential. So it's a good idea to mention all those adnexal and conjunctival signs because this patient does not have any. So it looks like inactive thyroid disease. And the third thing is the pupils are dilated. So I think these three things you should be keeping in mind. And I'll always start off this as a clinical colored photograph and a diffuse illumination where I can see that there is a prominence of the left eye and there is a superior inferior scleral show. And again mentioned that there is lid retraction and clearance show in the right eye as well. And then the pupils are dilated. So your first, because you are, you know, expected to know that all those complications which can arise from thyroid eye disease. And you know that one of the co complications is the corneal involvement, like exposure right. capacity that these patients have. So it's a good idea to mention the cornea as well as the pupils. So your examination is incomplete. Whenever you have a case of eyelid or orbit or pupils, you cannot, you know, they all three are, I have a separate slide for this. I'll tell you later. So I'll, I'll ask someone, someone else to, you know, tell me what if you walk into a, your clinical station and you get this patient sitting in front of you. So how are you going to approach this patient? So how, how are you going to start your examination? Slides before, uh, yeah. 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 Uh, starting from this one. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So as I mentioned, look for any scar, neck swelling, pseudoproptosis, lymph nodes, and you do a worm's eye or navigus view. Uh, this is the navigus view. And then you do go ahead and do a Hirschberg's comment on the axial versus the abaxial proptosis. And then you go ahead for the exothermometer. This is the Hurtle's exothermometer where I told you that you have to put these little uh, rims on the little object rim of the patient and then you have to see the base and then you measure the uh, your findings and you see the, after removing this parallax header you see where this vertical line is and then the anterior most part of the cornea which is touching this line is your final reading. Loose exothermometer is the one where, which you can be asked to do in the exam because it does not require a lot of manipulation. So this uh, this triangular edge has to go to the lateral orbital margin and this is a thing that they might ask you to do in your exam. You can put a scale right at the lateral orbital rim. And then you, you can, you can use this ruler when you, the ruler should be such, the angle should be such that it bisects the cornea. It should be at the center of cornea. That should be your reading. So if there's a difference of more than two in both eyes, that will tell you if, it's, if there's a proptosis or not. And this is the knowledge of thermometer, which I haven't used much. The only advantage of knowledge is that it does not require the these shafts to be placed on the lateral orbital rim. So if, if there's a trauma patient or a patient post surgery who has his lateral orbital rim is deranged, you can use this knowledge exothermometer. And this probably also would not be asked in the exam. Uh, the other important thing is if the patient has an abaxial proptosis. So what now? How would you measure this abaxial proptosis? For this, you need two scales. The first scale you would put here. You, you would mark a, a center point in the bridge of the nose like this, and then put a horizontal scale. And then with the with the help of a vertical scale, you can you know uh, see the central corneal reflex. How much is the central corneal reflex from this scale? So that will give you an idea whether it's an axial proptosis or an abaxial proptosis. So the, after this, you will have to do the vertical palpebral pressure height because if these patients have lid retraction, then you will do your ocular motility and then you will go ahead and do the pupillary examination. But if you think that this patient has orbital mass, then you have to do palpation as well. 
So all these points you can memorize or take a snapshot that you will have to mention in your examination, and then you know go ahead and do the diagnosis. But I don't think that they they'll give you a case with proptosis with the mass. But it's it's good to you know know all these points. So this is again a reinforcement of what I told you. When it's a case of eyelid or proptosis, you have to measure the uh, you have to check for the pupillary reflexes and the ocular motility. So to summarize, I'll first comment on the scar or any thyroid prominence that the patient might have. Then I'll comment on which eye looks prominent, whether it's a unilateral or a bilateral disease. Then rule out pseudo proptosis by mentioning all those points, all those causes of pseudo proptosis. Then if there if there are any adnexal or soft tissue or conjunctival corneal signs which are present in the patient. Then I'll go ahead and do my measurements. I'll first do Hirschberg's test, then Hertel's or Lutz or with the scale if they ask me to do. And then the if it's an avaxial proptosis, you have to have two scales to measure the amount of decentra decentration of the central corneal light reflex. And then you do the vertical passive fissure height and MRD. And if there's a mass, you do a, a palpation then. So after this, you go ahead and do the cover and cover, the alternate cover, check for ocular motility, including the saccades and the pursuit movements, and check for convergence. And then finally, the pupil and do a swinging flashlight in the end. So this is what I would do in the exam if I get a case of proptosis. I think it's a lot to ask, but if you have done it you know, 10 times before going to the exam, then I think it's pretty easy. You'll remember all the points.